evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, Today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. For who having heard rebelled indeed was it not all who came out of egypt led by moses now with whom was he angry 40 years was it not with those who sinned whose corpses fell in the wilderness and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest but to those who did not obey so we see that they could not enter enter in because of unbelief chapter 4 Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But we, but, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he was. He has said, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in, his, in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his work. And again, in, in, the, in the place they shall not enter, enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first, priests did not priest did not enter because of disobedience again he designates a certain day saying in david saying in david today uh, after such a long time as it it has been said today if you will hear his voice do not harden your heart for if joshua had given them rest then he would not afterward have spoken of another day there remains therefore a rest for the people of god for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent, diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is discerner of the thoughts and inherits of in, intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we, were, we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need let's pray father in heaven uh, we come into uh, come into your presence again and we ask we are going to listen to your word lord help us to to keep keen attention to it and lord you speak to us let your word bring you bring us closer to you and it work as your word says it should work as a sword to us lord lord i commit revision into your mighty hand lord speak through him i ask ask this Small prayer in the mass listening for Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for persevering through that long passage. I hope no one else fell asleep. Um, we read the two chapters together because we thought um, it is it goes together and we can have an overall idea of what is happening. First of all, chapter 3 starts off with, Therefore, holy brethren. We are not going into the therefore, but to the holy brethren. You know, Paul talks about, uh, talks to the Jews and also to the Gentiles, right? And then he calls them brethren. Now, this is the letter to the Hebrews, that is the Jews. So when he calls them, we don't know whether it is Paul, but when the writer calls them, says, holy brethren, 
partakers of the heavenly calling, it has a special meaning. It is not just the ordinary Jew, but it is the holy brethren who are partakers of the heavenly calling. Now I'm going to skip a few chapters and talk about chapter 8, where um, the writer compares the heavenly things with the earthly things. The earthly tabernacle with the heavenly tabernacle. So when he addresses them as holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, he addresses this to the Jews who were probably confused between the heavenly sacrifice, the sacrifice that has been made, and we have had access to the heavenly places versus the sacrifices that the high priest made in an earthly fashion. So it's very important to notice that this has been written to the Hebrews. Many a time we try to interpret this to the present day and present time, which is very good, but we tend to forget that it was addressed to the Hebrews. And then we end up making wrong conclusions. Um, it is very easy if you know the background to apply and understand it better. So this is addressed to the Hebrew believers who were probably a little bit confused about what was happening. I was born and brought up as a Catholic. I've said this many a time, but for those who do not know. You know, after that I came to the Lord, and I remember the first time I went back to Catholic Church, uh, maybe a week or two after that. And I simply couldn't identify myself with what was happening there. I simply couldn't identify myself. Then slowly I got into the believer's company. I, I, in fact, I got baptized. And after that, there was a bit of confusion there, which made me leave that. And then I went around hunting to understand what is the truth. I sampled so many different denominations and churches I don't even want to mention. And again, I went back to Catholic Church. Now, when you, when you come from such a background and go back there, yes, some of these things make sense. Some of that makes sense. What is the truth? So this is probably the state of mind in which the Hebrew believers were. So they come, they have come to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, and then they also have what is happening in the temple. We assume that it is before the um, destruction of the temple. Totally confused. So, so I just want to say Paul. Paul, maybe another writer, but... Uh, We'll use the name Paul here. And as Paul addresses them, he tells them one thing. Consider whom? The apostle and high priest of our confession, which is Christ Jesus. Christ, consider Christ Jesus, the apostle and high priest. Now the word consider comes up here and there last uh, Friday we were those who were there at the uh, fasting prayer also thought of consider and count. So, count who is Christ. Consider who is Christ. Uh, when we move on to chapter 10 and verse 24, there's again, uh, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good words. Consider. In chapter 12, uh, Consider him who endured hostility. Consider the Lord Jesus Christ. Consider the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the message that he brings up um, in this chapter. Consider Christ Jesus as the apostle, which we actually have thought about a few months back probably. The apostle. What do you mean by apostle? One who has been sent. Sent from where? Sent from the heavenly places. Sent by whom? By God the Father. 
And sent to whom? Sent to us. So we have the Lord Jesus Christ who has come from the heavens and gone back into the heavens. You know, um, even the Muslims actually talk about it. One of the things that they cannot answer is this. Okay, where did Isa come from? He came from heaven. Where is he now? In heaven. Where did Muhammad come from? He came from the earth. Where is he? He himself has stated, I don't know what will happen to me and to those who come after me. But we have somebody who has come from heaven, come down and go, gone back up into heavens. So that's the first thing. He is the apostle from heaven. And um, the first chapter the author focuses on that. Yes, he's come from heaven. He is God. He was the son of God. In form, he was God. In appearance, he was God. In substance, he was God. He is God. He has come down, and now he has gone back and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So why did he come? He came to purge our sins and win salvation for us. He came to bring that message of salvation. And so we are told in chapter 2, take care, do not neglect, um, do not neglect um, the message of salvation. And if you, if you neglect that, there is nothing else. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And then we talked about drifting away, drifting away. And we talked about um, men and women brought up as kids in, to, uh, in a very believing atmosphere, very committed atmosphere, launching out on their own into new cities, into new careers, into new places to study or whatsoever. Little by little, moving away and finally in a place where they could never ever have imagined themselves. Doctrinally, in their morality, in the way they look at life, in the way they interact with society in every way. So let us not drift away. And then towards the end of the and end of chapter two, Christ is presented as the merciful and faithful high priest. That's chapter, uh, chapter 2 and verse 17. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. And then we talked about that also a little bit, and I'm sure we all know this, that since we were of flesh and blood, he also came down from heaven and became like us, and so he knows what is happening. Even otherwise he would know. But now we know that he knows what is happening in our hearts, in our minds. He can understand. And he's merciful. And also there's uh, another other aspect of his faithful high priest. Um, verses 1 to 6. We'll read it once more. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling... Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son of his own house, whose house we are, if he hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So, here we talk about faithfulness. Christ's faithfulness. 
Verse 2 says, He was faithful to him who appointed him. Who appointed him? The Father. So Christ was faithful to the Father. And then, says, just as Moses also was faithful. And come verse 5, again talks about Moses' faithfulness. And then, Christ is presented as somebody more faithful. Actually, Christ is presented as faithful as Moses. And then, he's presented as more glorious of, worthy of more glory than um, uh, Moses, just as a builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. You know, that's a house of Mukesh Ambani, which used to be the, I don't know if that still is, which was the costliest um, uh, residence, right? So, uh, what was the name of that? I forget. Anyway, uh, we hardly ever think of that house, but think of him. Oh, he's so rich. The same way, rather than the house, the house of Moses, the house that where Moses ministered was the house of Israel. Right? Rather than the house, who has the honor? The one who built the house. The Lord, uh, God the Father. And Every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. God has built everything. Father has more honor than uh, Moses. And then we come and say, Christ himself has more honor. And chapter, uh, verse 6 brings us to the point, but Christ as a son has been faithful over his own house. Christ, faithful to him who appointed him, that is to God. And Christ, faithful over what? He had a mission. He had something to do. He is faithful over that. And what is that? His own house. And who is his own house? We. Now, there are verses like this in Hebrews. We would like to pick on them. And debate whether salvation will be salvation will be lost, and that is the interesting topics that we get into in Hebrews, and we actually get carried away with that um, and forget the real um, core of the message there. The core of the message is in this verse. If, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end, holding fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope, simply put, that is the most important thing. And now we want to find out, we get into discussion whether salvation will, would be lost, and we have lost the whole point. Um, Verse 6 and verse 14 as well. Okay, there also we got something similar. For we have become partakers of Christ if, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So, what do we do with these verses? First of all, let's understand wherever we see if, it or, does not always mean that is a condition as such. It could also be the evidence of things that is in you. The evidence of true faith is holding fast the confession till the end. The most important thing for us to grasp from this chapter is to hold fast our confession till the end. You know, there are lots of theologians around here. And one of the things I refuse to do is to get into one of the theological schools. Because if you, once you plug into that, along with that comes a lot of baggage which that theological school sells. And we have to defend even things that we don't believe in. 
uh, we just need to study the scripture as it is in its entirety and understand this. We know that we don't need to do anything to receive salvation. Correct? We have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. Even the faith that we have is not of ourselves. So we don't have to do anything more to receive salvation. So probably this is not talking about doing something more that we have salvation. We don't add anything more to Christ's sacrifice to appropriate that salvation for us. But here, the Hebrews, the confused Hebrew, the confused Hebrew believer, just as I was a confused um, believer from a Catholic background and trying to figure out. So he's, he's being told, we are his house. He will be faithful over us if we hold fast the confidence, if we hold fast our rejoicing till the end. Hold fast to Christ. Hold fast to the high priest. Hold fast to Christ. Forget all the trappings of the ceremony that is there. The trappings of the society that is there. See, we are not brethren. We are not any denomination. Who are we? We are God's children. We are God's children. We need to hold on to that aspect rather than try to justify and understand some practices here and some practices there and get into discussions and arguments over what is right and what is wrong. Rather, hold fast to Christ. And then, verse 7 onwards, we have um, something's happening. We'll read from verse 7 till 14. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the days of trial, the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, They shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Verse 15 as well. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Okay, we are his house and that is being proved to us by our holding fast till the end. Okay, that's what we talked about. Now he says, beware against an evil heart of unbelief. Verse 12, beware brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Look at verse 8. That is, do not harden your hearts. Okay, so it, this talks about heart. In verse 8, it talks about hearts. And come to verse 10. They always go astray in their heart. And here verse 12 again. Beware lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Heart, heart, heart. What are we prone to do as kids that have grown up in believing homes? We are tend to do, 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 keep rules, make an appearance, and not deal with our heart. 
we are very familiar with um, the verse, Jeremiah chapter 17, which says, The heart is deceitful above. That's a very interesting chapter. I'd love you to turn to chapter 17 and read verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. So first he says, Cursed is the man whose heart departs from the Lord. Of course, this was in that uh, period of time, but it holds good for us. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Doesn't matter where you go for worship. If our heart departs from the Lord, we are cursed. Verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. And whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. And comes our famous verse, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is the thing that we need to deal with. If our heart is right before the Lord, we will hold fast to him and we'll be there till the end. Does our mind not matter? It does matter. But if our heart is not right with the Lord, we are cursed. If our heart is right with the Lord, we will be like a tree planted by the waters. When heat comes, when heat comes in our life, we have nothing to worry. He will not fear when heat comes. Its leaf will still be green. And he will not be anxious in the year of drought. So, what is this thing about heart? The real warning comes in chap uh, verse 12, chapter 3, verse 12. We are in Hebrews now. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. So what is an evil heart? A heart that does not believe. A heart of unbelief. Beware. What do you mean by beware? Take heed. Okay. That's likely to be attacked. Take care of the flock. It's an instruction to elders as well. Take care. Why? The enemy is prowling around. And we need to take care. We need to take care of our hearts and make sure that it is not evil. It's not an evil heart of unbelief. Now, there are a few verses that are coming earlier on. It says, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And again, verse 10, they go astray in their heart. They go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So a heart that has not gone away knows the Lord's ways. What does that mean? The other day again we were talking about it. Knowing is not a head knowledge. It is an intimate knowledge. There's intimacy in that knowledge. Okay. So, they have not known my ways. They have not known them and grasped them on in their heart. Do not harden your hearts. See, hardening can come quickly in certain things. Sometimes it is ever so slow. You know, if you live in very cold places, there are 
reverse that flow and as winter sets in there'll be water flows underneath and there'll be small layers of ice and slowly slowly the ice goes in and in and finally you can walk over it you can cycle over it you can drive your car over it because it is so thick still water flows underneath why it has become hardened 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 unless the sun comes and melts it away or the water beneath heats it up and melts it away it will be hard okay. hardness can come in slowly over the flowing water take care that our hearts do not get hardened you know i used to work in steel plant so this was not my department but this what they call blast furnace i'm sure most people must have learned at least in school something about it so you put the iron ore and many other crushed things from top big huge chimney like thing and it, as it descends there is a blast of gas that is given okay and and there's a lot of reactions taking place it is heated up and it is all the rock that is descending is melted and it comes as melted iron and slag at the bottom so there is a blast of air that keeps pumping but not air different gases that keeps pumping what happens if the power fails and the gas goes off so we see your system blast furnace is hanging she is hanging there that's a message that goes out why it is no more getting melted it is becoming hardened and um three four hours without that you will take a month or two to clear that blast furnace and it becomes so hard inside there should be the blast of the holy spirit in us in our hearts so that we are always soft we are always there knowing god and his ways otherwise we become hardened in our hearts and then we drift away beware brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living god so it is very difficult to say what exactly would be in the life of another person unless if he has continued we know that his faith was genuine okay so what do we do with um with our hearts we keep on guarding it and how do we guard it probably we need to look at some of the examples there and then we will understand so first of all it is going to be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin sin is deceiving it doesn't come out right and say i am bad you taste me he says i'm okay oh is that really so it comes ever so slowly we always talk about what happened to adam and eve right how the how sin deceived slowly sin still deceives and to us as we fall into sin and if we get into habitual sins and then we retrace our steps and look back we will understand that there was a point when we slowly got deceived and we said ah yes that's all right ah, this, we are not doing that we justified ourselves and we justify ourselves and we justify ourselves see we never even the worst murderer will have a justification the thief will have a justification and the murderer might have revenge as the justification 
But slowly, you have to justify something in your own heart. Otherwise, you'll go crazy with your actions. But if your heart itself is evil, the justification is not valid. The deceitfulness of sin. Guard against that. Um, verse 16 now do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion for who having heard rebelled indeed was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses now with whom was he angry 40 years was it not those was it not with those who sinned whose corpses fell in the wilderness and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest but to those who did not obey the people of god had come out of egypt correct Everything is nice now. Okay, we were under bondage. We were under slavery. We had to make bricks. And then there was more and more trouble there. We had hard labor. And Pharaoh tried to kill us and our children and wouldn't allow our children to survive. He influenced the midwives. Now we are free. Now we have broken loose. We have crossed the Red Sea. And the carcasses of Pharaoh and his, um, and his soldiers, they have been washed ashore from the Red Sea. Their weapons of destruction have been destroyed. Hallelujah. And they sang. And they sang the song of Moses. The horse and the rider, he has thrown into the sea. Miriam and the women came out singing and dancing, singing with timbrels and dancing. And what did they think of at that point? We are going to be like our Egyptian masters. We will be in a land of our own. A land that flows with milk and honey. We will each be sitting under our vines and our fig, fig trees. No, uh, sometimes it helps us to understand the geography also, right? The vines that are spread okay, in the summer, just resting under the shade of the vines and the fig trees. And Joseph had his bones carried away from Egypt to be, gone and to be buried where? In the land of Israel, the, 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 the land of Canaan. And these people hoped to live and die and be buried in Canaan. And what happened to them? 600,000 men crossed besides women and children. So I'm assuming that it is approximately 1.2 million people that died in the wilderness in 40 years. So many, so many. Per day, probably around 80 to 90 people died. There was always weeping. I'd like to take us to um, Exodus um, a little bit. In Exodus 12, we see them moving out of, the, of Passover. And then um, in chapter 13, 
they are given a lot of instructions and we see in um, uh, chapter 13 verse 21 and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them to give them light okay beautiful he is leading them out the 600,000 maybe 2 million 2.5 million people 2.5 million I think um, Bangalore population was around 4 million around uh, decade back now it must be uh, so many so maybe at least 10 percent 15 percent of the population of Bangalore they are being let out and there's a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire and then they uh, come to chapter 14 verse 10 and when Pharaoh, Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us? to bring us up out of Egypt. What was God's plan? That they would go and dwell in the land of Canaan. They have not even crossed the Red Sea and they are saying, have you brought us out to get buried in this wilderness? Is this what you have to offer? That was the start. God was gracious did not hold anything against them, gave them a victory, took them through the Red Sea. And they cross over, they come. In chapter 15, there's the song of redemption. And hardly they finish that. Uh, chapter 15 and verse 23. When they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bit, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people complained against Moses, "What shall we drink?" So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is again being merciful. And then they don't have bread in chapter sixteen. They have their needing tough, but they don't have bread. The Lord supplies bread from heaven. And in chapter 17, there is no water at all. God gives them water from the rock. Step by step, step by step. What did the Lord want when they, when they went through these difficulties? I am the one who sent those plagues on the Egyptians and set you free. Look at me. In their hearts, they did not glorify God. They did not know the works of God. Each time. And they said, oh, we will never make it. And finally, they come to Kadesh Bani and they see the land and they send the spies into the land. And the spies go out and say, Oh, it's a beautiful land. Nothing like it. Much better than Egypt. But we are not going to make it. There are giants in the land. They rebelled, they rebelled, they rebelled. The evil heart of unbelief is a heart of rebellion. The heart that questions every, everything that comes in our life and does not take hold of God and Christ is a heart of rebellion. Now, we don't have time to go on to the rest. But let us take these people that have come out 
Did, they, did the Lord sell them back into slavery? No, he didn't. He dealt with them. Okay. And their carcasses fell in the, in the wilderness. And there were no graves. They had to dig graves in the wilderness. Can you imagine that place, that stretch of land, even now probably has the corpse of around one, one and a half million people just because of rebellion against God. And finally, they come out of the promised land and they reach the promised land. Um, and Joshua is supposed to have given them rest. I just have to give an overview of the next chapter. Supposed to have given them rest. They got settled in their land. But what does David say after many years, many, um, many decades and centuries, what does he say? Harden not your hearts. He, um, if he speaks to you, listen to him. Okay, um, so, um, when you come to chapter 4 and verse 7, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So, there was still a rest other than the rest of Canaan for the people of God. Um, we do not have time to go into it, but I just need to tell us believers this. Either we can spend the rest of our lives in the wilderness, not taking hold of God, we will have troubles in family, with children, with our education, with our jobs, with our finances, you name it, with our health. The evil heart of unbelief would say, what God? Why God? We will come to those places, but immediately fall back. Immediately, when we understand that sin is deceiving us, fall back and get right with the Lord the same day. Yeah. As a young kid, um, my dad always used to tell me two things. He was a Catholic, so the morning he used to say, as soon as you get up, sit on the bed and, and think of, take some time to figure out what you will do for the day. And before going to bed, he says, just think of your day and analyze it and say sorry to God. It was a very simple thing. I believe my uh, dad died a believer, though they cannot say that for sure because he, was, uh, he had a stroke at the end. Anyway, at the end of our day, can we go back and examine our heart. Our heart is the thing that we need to deal with. It is not the quiet time practice or the, the family prayer practice. These practices are important. But if it does not proceed out of a sincere heart, a believing heart, a heart that holds fast till the end, no use. You might be a saved believer. You are not going to lose that salvation. And you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything other than trust in his um, redeeming grace to obtain that salvation. But our lives here on this earth will be a misery rather than a fruitful service to God rather than a rest for our souls if we do not take hold of God, if we do not submit our hearts to the Lord. At our wedding, we, we are particular that we sing a song 
and um, we sang it all the way my savior leads me tears each winding path i tread he gives me grace for every trial and he feeds me with the living bread and talks about when we are weary and thirsty gushing from the rock before us i will see a spring of joy till the day we are clothed with the with our immortal self and go in his presence the savior is there to lead us and guide us things will be difficult things will be very hard but the savior is by our side and unless we take hold of that god and know him with a heart not just in our intellect with all the knowledge that has been drilled into us through sunday school and what not it avails nothing we might be saved believers but we might be living the with the wilderness journey never able to enter Canaan in this life a life of resting in him come what may and that is what um, we see in chapter 4 so to put it briefly Christ uh, up the apostle from heaven has gone back into heavens after purging our sins away by his sacrifice on the cross he has gone and sat at the right hand of the majesty and he is sitting and resting and at the same time he is making intercession for us and while we talk about rest one small little thing what is rest there are different kinds of rest you know when we are tired we rest rest from our from weariness or you are taking rest what do you mean that oh there is no work to them resting just indulging and in whatsoever but the rest that is spoken of here is uh, resting in god who has finished his work of salvation but still is active for us interceding with the father for us it is that kind of um rest that we talk about while our hearts are at rest we work for him and that is the call for the believer so let us hold fast to a confession not only the confession that he is our savior but that he is our guide and he is he is our team leader he is our captain through our life he is taking us to glory and even in this life he will be with us when our hearts are stayed on him in that we will be there but in between if it gets hardened we might go back into wilderness let us come and stay in the land of promise by guarding our hearts against unbelief beware brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief that is what will take us away in departing from the living god we will come and rest where will we rest under the shadow of the almighty and then we will find rest for our souls let's pray Father in heaven we want to thank you for all the beautiful things that are there in the scripture to instruct us we pray that all this knowledge will not remain a knowledge that's of no use to us or a knowledge that will condemn us rather help us to have hearts that are trusting taking hold of you blessed is the man who trusts in the lord who makes the lord his refuge cursed is the man who trusts in man 
help us not to trust in man either in our own selves or in others help us not to trust in man made systems help us to take hold of you at each and every moment and help us be people who would not fall by the wayside help us not to be people who would be wandering through wilderness till we die pray that you would help us to come to your rest and stay there as we see later that we have a merciful priest high priest in the whose presence we can come at the time of need not after we have fallen sometimes that also happens to us you are there even after we have fallen but you are there to support us even before we fall and help us to rest in you help us that we will take care of our hearts and that sin will not deceive us the heart that is deceitful above all help us to take control of that not hardening it but making it trust in our father in our savior help us to be led by the spirit of god help us not to be led by our own flesh in christ's precious name we pray